What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network here back at the Understanding Bitcoin Conference in Malta. And I'm joined today by two peers from the Brains OS, uh, the slush mining pool operating system. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have here... Um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, John. Yeah. <laughs> and your last name? Uh, Chapek. Chapek, perfect. And Pavel? Moravets. Very well. Okay. Um, so, Piers, uh, Jan, you've been here on the uh, show a couple times already. Uh, Pavel, you're, I think, the first time here on the World Crypto Network. Uh, so, could you just give a brief explanation of, of how you got into Bitcoin and, and just your brief story? Yeah, we, we uh, created a company with Jan in 2011. We started with Embedded Software. And I'm a friend of Marek Slash from childhood. And we joined him like in 2013 when we, let's say, take over a development and operational slush pool in 2013. And this was how I get really heavily involved in, in, in Bitcoin. Before that, I was just hearing someone there, something. It was really interesting about, but the 2013 is the, the break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Jan, you had a presentation earlier, uh, kind of like hacking a little bit uh, in the hardware of the, uh, the Bitmain um, S9 miners. Uh, so, could you just give a little TLDR on, on what was happening there? Okay. Uh, so, the basic idea, it was like uh, two months ago, uh, it was Adam Beck and uh, Giacomo, they just came to me and said like, oh, hey, we are doing this conference in Malta and could you just uh, introduce mining for every Joe? And like basically I realized that it, it's not so easy to enter, you know, the, the mining industry and even on, on like a basic user level. So the point of the presentation was just to show basic aspects of the miners. That means like you need to register somewhere with the pool, you need to set the mining URL and just run the unit. And you have to be aware that it's noisy and it needs some maintenance. And as part of the presentation, uh, we obviously wanted to point out certain aspects of, of the mining hardware that has um, there's a big shift uh, in the perception of the mining uh, in the past two years because initially there, it was just uh, CPU and GPU mining, which was in, uh, essentially open source stuff uh, based on CG miner. And these days, uh, nobody really knows what's, what, what these devices are doing because the manufacturers, they're releasing them closed source uh, without providing like the proper documentation and stuff like that, which... Theoretically, it's okay if there were not features and like special bonus features like Enbly that we had the, the affair a few years ago, ASIC Boost that was there like two years ago, uh, a feature that people, if they had it available, I mean, they technically had it available in their hardware, but they couldn't use it because the manufacturer decided not to. Uh, they could have been saving like 13% of energy. And like the, all these things have been like puzzling us. And since we were originally embedded uh, system engineers, we really were able to come up with an open source alternative for those ASIC miners because the, the miners themselves, they're not like complicated devices, but it's not about the, the CG miner that you can run on your machine, but it's, it's really uh, the whole Linux distribution that should be open, that contains some firmware parts that are critical for driving the hash cards and so on. So, so we really started this BrainSOS initiative in order to, to, to have some community open source alternative to the stock firmwares. So that's it. And I was trying to, to show uh, and demo how you can use it, how you, how you can do like seamless upgrades, and how you can make it mine with, with uh, an S9 or a T1. That's it. Sorry for a long answer. <laughs> Oh, very nice. I love long answers all the time. <laughs> uh, so, Paul, <laughs> um, so what was this new feature uh, that uh, Bitmain put into their uh, as, or hardware? And um, like, right, what, what exactly did it do with their latest upgrade? It caught me a little bit surprised because what I spend time with is uh, the slush pool stuff. I'm basically developing all the... Or, uh, leading development of slash pool, uh, but lately I have I didn't have a lot of time spending my uh, keyboard in, on on uh, the, the embedded stuff. So Jan is probably better uh, to explain this stuff. But the basic thing is they are trying to hide um, SSH ports, like like preventing you to uh, communicate with the hardware uh, on the let's say more low level uh, level. Uh, but I'll probably yeah. let him explain. Mm -hmm. um, it actually started with the S15 uh, firmware uh, that already has been signed. 
uh, I mean, digital designing uh, a piece of software or the firmware that you're supposed to deploy into your machine is uh, a great idea because it prevents uh, various kinds of uh, security leaks and attacks. The problem is that if the intention is not to protect the, the user from, from uh, downloading and upgrading their machine with some malicious uh, piece of uh, software, uh, but if, if part of the agenda is actually to prevent the user to really own the, the the mining hardware and to access it in a way that he or she wants, and this is exactly what what was the uh, the the thing with the S15 firmware. And the late latest development shows that they're actually porting this uh, feature of uh, locking the, the the user out of the miner, so that the only way they can access it is is an API and and the web interface. But they just cannot use SSH to get into the machine anymore, uh, and. Since the, the the firmware is signed, once you upgrade, nothing else can be easily uh, flashed in, into the miner. So uh, this is something that is not acceptable, and that that the community should actually react very strictly uh, against it. Uh, and I think we're providing a very competitive alternative in the Brains OS uh, open source uh, firmware. And obviously, we are also protecting it with uh, with the signing part. So basically, once you flash over to Brains OS, you just cannot, like, if you compile your own image, you need to know what you need to configure uh, in the system so that it accepts your image. But we're not preventing you from doing it. But at the same time, since it works as a regular Linux distribution, it has all the signing protections. So it will not allow downloading any unauthorized packages that, has not, that have not been signed by, by us or by our release servers. So this is the, the story behind the, the, the development. I think the this is pretty new with the S9 firmware, it's, it's, it's like three days ago uh, when some of the miners like just got back to us and it's like, oh, hey, we cannot use this. And I was like, well, do you guys want to test uh, the, our, our image? And they say, well, yeah, we'll, we'll try it. And then it turns out that this actually fulfills their requirements on the level of security that's provided by having a signed firmware, but at the same time, they have like a full control of the devices. So, um, yeah. Um, and of course, right? It's it's your hardware, right? It, and you should have full access to it. And of course, when you when you run software on top like BrainsOS, yes, there there are some basic configurations and like the standard version, you're not going to tinker around too much with it. And then having these signatures uh, is very okay, right? But then of course, when you you always have the opportunity uh, to changing some details and to well to change anything, right? Uh, and so that is something that the Bitmain hardware or the software firmware uh, does not allow, right? But that's, of course, very much against the ethos of open source and, and Libre software and hardware. Uh, so where are like the, yeah, the, the licensing and, and the, the like legal aspects of this? Uh, yeah, obviously, what you said is 100% uh, true. Uh, there is one, one catch uh, with closed source used by, or open source used by Bitmain. Uh, they happily take from the open source community by using open source software, but they should put the resource or the, the source code back. If they change anything, uh, they should provide it back to the community and they are not doing that. Uh, so right now it's difficult to say what's exactly there, but historically we know that there were a lot of open source software used. Uh, so this should not happen. It's difficult to do anything with with it, but the community at least uh, should know about it. Yeah, mm, yeah very much so. Um, yeah, maybe uh, you as well. So because they they use open source software, right? But they they don't contribute back, or they even make it artificially difficult uh, of checking the software and then uh, seeing it and, and getting into it. Um, what are the the consequences of that? Well, um, well, this is the violation of the of the GPL, and I'm sure there are many more licenses involved because the 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 range of software that is used uh, within the 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 hardware units is pretty wide. So I think it's just a matter of time. There's going to be some lawsuit where somebody is going to request uh, if they. I mean, technically. Uh, they're not uh, supposed to give you the sources until you're entitled to have them because you bought the hardware, right? So just by the by the mere fact that I download uh, a, a CG miner or any other component as a, as a GPL licensed software and I do my own modifications, 
I'm not forced to give it back to the community unless I have a product that I sell or I provide the product. And that means the, the sources have to go along with the product. And one of the reasoning is that sometimes they say, oh, it's available here on GitHub, but it's like two years outdated source code, uh, which doesn't reflect the, the latest development that's actually, uh, or what of the software that's actually running in the physical machine. So I think it's a question of time, but at the same time, well, what, what we can do, we can just ignore it and try to go our own way. And if we, if we try setting the new standard of quality, because honestly, I mean, the quality that we see in the, in the CG minor patches is not very high. Uh, we can just ignore it and build our own stuff as a community. I'm, we don't, I don't mean us as brain systems or I mean, as a community. Yeah, right. And, and that's the thing with open source software. It, it is not just a company or a firm doing it. It's the entire community because everyone who is running the software has access to the source code and he can see, pa- uh, he can see the bugs that are in there, uh, proposed patches, uh, and then push them upstream, right? Uh, but that, of course, is no longer possible with, with complete closed source software. Uh, so maybe if we then see both the, the closed source uh, and minor firm, uh, firmware and then Brains OS, uh, is there really a, a concrete like, equality difference? Uh, that like, one is much better than the other? I have uh, an input on this. Um, maybe one a good example. Um, when you look at the latest uh, release, I mean, not, not considering the one that just locked everything out, but the, the, the one of the recent ones, uh, for some reason, uh, for example, the boot time on the factory firmware got much worse. Uh, nobody knows really why. Um, we also have some big farms that talk to us and they say, well, we tried flashing a few, uni- a few units with the latest, latest factory firmware. And like, we had such a big failure ratio that we tried your software and, uh, it worked. So, I mean, it's usually case by case. I mean, currently there's no, uh, like, like super quality upgrade in terms of like that we would be making more hashes than, than the factory firmware, because that's not possible from, from physical perspective. But uh, what we see, the user experience that we're trying to achieve with the product, we want to make something with a better quality that has some uh, like seamless software upgrades. This is something that is like so common and so expected in any other uh, area, like your cell phone. When you upgrade your cell phone, do you go to manufacturer website and try to search what is the right image for your Android. No, you just click, you want to do all the air update and that's it. And this is, this is not for like retail users, but also the bigger farms are going to benefit from this because if they have a good quality of software, they, the total cost of ownership of all these units is going to go lower, right? You don't want to have technicians running around the farm all the time and trying to flash the units one by one and so on. So yeah, I mean, it's up to us and it's up to the community what, what they want in the firmware, what they want, uh, what is the direction which, which they want to set. Um, another example that I can think of could be, for example, upgrading the, the mining protocol. If there is a community-wide uh, code base for uh, miners, for, for Bitcoin miners, let's speak, or Bitcoin miners, um, upgrading the mining protocol it would be much simpler than if you have like five different manufacturers, each of them has their own clone of the mining software, um, which would cause integration problems and similar things. So this is what I see on a, on a, like a longer uh, run, what could benefit uh, from, from this being the open source thing. Yeah, very much so, right? And and having this open community standard is is then very much for later versions as well, uh, very important. Uh, so, but does Brains OS work just with ant miners, or are there other hardwares that support or that can be run with this firmware as well? Yeah, there are mo- more of them. Uh, the S nines are the prime are, are the biggest probably. T ones from uh, uh, Inner Silicon is the second one. Uh, in theory. You could support any hardware, but we really started with the most uh, most available ones. Uh, it will depend on how many people uh, would buy different piece of hardware. And uh, into the future, we would like to rebuild 
the the software in a sense that it's easy to bring a new support for new hardware. It's not right now the the case because we started with a pretty old uh, let's say code base and it needs to be rewritten basically to to allow the more pluginish uh, way how to uh, software operates. But then it it should be pretty straightforward to support new hardware. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very nice. And how how is it with these other hardwares, uh, other than the Bitmain hardware? What how is their so, uh, firmware, and is it as bad as as Bitmain? Um, I I don't want to comment on on like any other products uh, until I see them from the inside, because I mean, one thing when you look at other manufacturers, uh, it's usually again difficult to fetch the sources and like look into how the thing works and considering that you would integrate it into your um into your project um so i don't want to comment like on, on the quality itself but it's not like when there is a new manufacturer they would be like hey there's this is the place where you can download the sources and join the community and let's start developing and whatever so this is also our long-term plan of having this incentive for the manufacturers because they would actually be, it's kind of like with the Linux kernel, right? When you want to produce uh, um, an embedded system, you can write their, your own operating system, but why would you do it? You just want to use something that is considered to be an industry standard. So you go to the Linux kernel, you, you download it, and because you don't want to maintain the patches, the, the changes that you make, the, the custom drivers for your hardware, you just contribute it back. So you have a direct incentive to lower your, your development costs and contribu contribute back to the software. And this is going to take some time for, for, for the vendors and manufacturers to understand this. And I mean, we don't want to push them. We just want to push them by what, we're, by what we're doing. And maybe one day they come up with this uh, idea on their own. So we'll see. Yeah, I think it's partly a culture problem. It's, it's going to take some, some time. Because it's it's not obvious thing to uh, put your effort and give it to everybody for free, mm -hmm. and it takes some time when people realize it's in their own interest. Yeah, um, yeah, right. And that's the that's the entire open source ethos, right? Yeah. It's it's you contribute back. We help each other out. And of course, right, it, it takes time and effort and intention to write the software. But once it is written, it's out there, and it's it, and then when you share the source code, you don't give anything away. Right? You still retain the code yourself. And as information is non-scarce speech, and you can share it with others without sacrificing yourself, other than, of course, the time that it took you to develop it. Um, but so, yeah, and I, I guess like um, then jumping off of that, as, as we said, with open source firmware, it's also easier to, to upgrade than in the future. And one possible upgrade for especially the mining protocol uh, would be Matt Carollo's uh, better hash. Uh, and he, he was also or, or already on the World Crypto Network a couple months back um, describing a little bit how it works. But uh, could you just give us a, a rundown on where the differences are to the current implementation? Well, we'll start with this. Um, yeah, there is a lot of different features which the protocol tries to bring. One a particular is it's completely binary. Uh, the current protocol, is, which is used for basically all the mining in the world, even for uh, altcoins, is based on uh, JSON messages, uh, which, which is quite inefficient on, on the on network level. There is a bunch of different stuff or difficult stuff going on there, which would be like, which is unfortunate, but it's it's like it is. It the protocol should be changed like years ago already, but it's really difficult to synchronize everybody. Uh, pools on one side, proxies, hardware manufacturers with their firmwares. So yeah, there is there is a lot of changes in in the protocol proposed. Uh, one particular thing which is really interesting on the Matt's uh, proposal is he would like to allow miners to choose transactions in the blocks they mine, uh, which is a great idea. And we are really on the same page on this. Uh, but we don't think the proposed way how to do it is scalable. And we are basically unable to support it uh, on our pool right now. Uh, but we are having a different proposal and we are trying to somehow synchronize in what we would like to see in the next protocol uh, with him because 
as we already discussed, it's, it's difficult to upgrade. So having only one proposal would be really beneficial. Uh, and we, we have obviously for long years, we, we uh, operate the pool. We have some experience what we would like to see in the protocol and from the embedded side, what we would like to see uh, in the protocol for the mining machines. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Okay. okay, so um, I didn't know about, about the binary aspect. That's, of course, really nice for increased efficiency. Um, but I would say also, especially because the candidate block is now constructed by the individual miner, um, it is uh, less or less easy to be, um, or it's, it, it's a further decentralization in a sense that the transaction can, or it's much diff more difficult to censor transactions when every single individual miner himself uh, has the opportunity to choose whichever transaction he includes. Um, so, th would you say that this is really a, a also on a, a security point of view, on a consensus level, a quite important? Um, it has like both sides. Um, when you look at the miners, uh, most of them are very like return of investment oriented, right? So they really don't care. Most of them don't even understand like the underlying things because what I want to point out is mining industry changed in a way that. I mean, running the, the mining operation is like a completely different sport from what we're doing with the pool. So they really don't care about like our small things that we think are an improvement. I mean, there are going to be groups of people that may be interested in their own custom transaction selection. But even after discussing those things with Matt, I, I think our common conclusion is that this feature may not be used as often as people may think where at the same time i want to add that it is important to have the option uh to have something similar to that okay but so with with better hash it would still be possible that the mining pool proposes a candidate block and then the individual miner can do the hashing on top of that or the individual miner can himself create the candidate block and then prove afterwards uh, that he has or that he was going to contribute to slash pool as the mining pool. Yes, but the devil is in the details. Um, the problems with the, the proposal is about me as a miner, I can force pool to accept my work without the pool capable of validating that I am spending the time on the right proper valid block, it, which is it's a security issue from our side. Like we, could, we, we would not be able to validate, uh, the hash can be checked, but we cannot validate that the block, which is uh, mining to, is a proper block. Mm -hmm. So our intended way how to how to solve it is to have some negotiation at the beginning before the miner starts to mine on the transaction set we uh, which he can choose but there needs to be some communication before so that the pool can accept the work and let the miner do whatever he wants there are some other complications uh, along these lines it's pretty technical but yeah i would say the critical thing is we try to get in this direction and we, we need to figure out how to exactly do it so that it's scalable in large operation uh, because we, we have like 20 servers all over the world and it needs to be like connected to one server and it needs to work against the other one and so on and so on. So there is a lot of technical details which need to be right. But then I think we are pretty in heading in the same direction in this sense. Okay, okay, very nice. And uh, so other than uh, the binary and the uh, opportunity, oh, oh, yeah, no, so, yeah, no, binary, and other than the opportunity to, for the individual miner to create the candidate block, what are some other features that would be possible with this new protocol? Mm, parts, uh, there have been cases uh, where you can uh, attack uh, the BGP protocol and you could s basically hijack hash rate because Stratum itself currently doesn't have any authentication parts. So um, you don't know wh who you're talking to, uh, even with a client or, with, or within the server. So um, one protection within the protocol would be signing of uh, critical parts of 
of the messages. I'm not speaking about encryption because technically you don't need to encrypt much, uh, but signing of messages that would prevent a hijacking attacks like this. So, yeah, you you would like to have, uh, let's say, a public key of the pools you are going to connect to and know for sure that the work you are working on is really from the pool or from another pool. The hijacking part is problem for the miners, not, not, not for the pools. And there's one thing which can be really much better than it is right now, and it's a validation uh, efficiency on, uh, of, the, of the work. Uh, currently, we could achieve something like 10x efficiency improvement in validation speed on the on the server side if the pro protocol is designed the way we, we intend to, which is pretty significant because then we can increase the submission rate and therefore decrease the, the variance of, of the hash rate uh, from the miners' perspective. So there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of fruit you can you can bring. Yeah, it's. Pretty, pretty interesting work. Okay, very nice. So yeah, always uh, lots of improvements to come, right? Um, and how about so specifically for for Slashpool? Um, what are some other innovations that you're working on, and, and some other further improvements uh, that might come in the uh, well next two weeks? <laughs> 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 yeah, next two weeks. <laughs> yeah, the next two weeks is. Uh, is the critical part. I'm, I'm, I'm not, not sure if it's really next. It's the first week and the last week, and then we can, <laughs> I will let explain Jan. So in the past two weeks, <laughs> we have actually released a, a new website. And uh, speaking of the website, I don't mean the, just the facelift, but we're coming with some new fancy features uh, where people could be, using like various payout schemes. It's not deployed yet, but the, the, if the framework, so the, what we have deployed is set up for this. So this is like the first step. Um, this is for the pool. Uh, like we have already mentioned, uh, or we were discussing the, the support for, for more mining hardware. We're obviously working on a, pretty much a rewrite of the whole mining software in Rust, which is the, the language of, of today. Uh, and this probably comes along with the, with the new mining protocol once we come to an agreement between uh, people involved within the protocol specification like Matt Corral and others. Okay, um, so could you then please go a bit more into the different payout uh, options now that you're uh, tinkering with? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, what, we, what would you like to uh, allow to our users is to set up their payout addresses more elaborately, let's say. Uh, we can see use cases for big users like we would like to send $1,000 uh, worth of Bitcoin every day to this address, 20% of all mined Bitcoins to this address, and so on and so forth. So, and right now we have just one uh, payout address on the account. Uh, so what we would like to uh, bring to the users is much better configurability of the payout scheme, uh, which hopefully will be out in two weeks <laughs> and the next two weeks, uh, roughly one to two months. It's, it's, it should be possible, but it's difficult to say in a, in a uh, particular dates, but yeah, and this roughly in this time frame, we are really working on it right now. Okay, and so then it would be roughly possible that the miner could specify that, for example, one thousand euros worth uh, of his mining revenue uh, should go into a separate wallet, yeah. uh, and then that wallet would, for example, pay for electricity, yeah. right? And then another part would uh, or payout address uh, might be used for, for example, employees. Um, or then for the hodling stash, right? Yeah, the savings. Yeah, that's it. That's pretty much you. You describe the whole scheme. Like uh, we want to make it like really configurable, and these are like the basic use cases that we have been collecting from the miners, specifically the one with the with the electricity bill, because I mean the exchange rate of Bitcoin changes, and they want to have and the, and the, and their electricity bill is pretty much fixed to the rate that they have agreed with the power plant. So. 
Yeah. Uh, there is one more uh, kind of uh, pair we would like to introduce, probably later in the future, because it takes more time to uh, find out how to implement it. But it is about lightning payments. We would really like to, it's a toy project basically, because right now the, the lightning network is not capable easily to send larger amount of money. But we would like to be able to create a lightning channel as a payment and later we're, let's say, like a lightning hub. So when the miner spends his money over a channel, uh, immediately when he mines something new, we can put the money back. So we can all the time refill his wallet, lightning wallet, so he, he or she could have all the time money available for spending on the lightning network, which is more like a toy project, but it, it would show one of the use cases for lightning. Um, yeah, so, so in that sense, right, because uh, the, the revenue of the miner would always be inbound liquidity, or, or well, well, no, sorry, it will, it will be outbound liquidity, right? You would push the money to his side of the channel. Uh, and that might be quite nice here in, in a balancing act as well for liquidity management. Right. Um, so do you then think that in the future we might see like, pay per share in the quite literal sense, right? that every share that you provide, you actually get paid out a couple of Satoshis over Lightning? Um, it dip I would say this would probably depend also on the user spendings because, I mean, you cannot, um, you have to find some granularity on how big uh, or how often you're going to open the new channels. Uh, which pretty much now would be if you have your payout threshold set to a certain value, instead of doing like a regular payout, you open the channel and you push the balance on 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 the user side. Um, the question with the with the PPS, I'm, I'm not quite sure about. For some, from for academic purposes, I think this is doable. Uh, for like actual miners or bigger farms, I don't think this is like the the use case. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, I, I'm thinking like a couple of years back in the future, right? When the miner is paying for his electricity as a streaming service, maybe as well, right? So he's he's paying or like paying out to the electricity company over Lightning for every kilowatt hour that he uses. Uh, but he, then he gets immediately the revenue back, like in the liquidity back on his side of the channel as soon as he does the hashing, right? So might, might that be something? I mean, like that would be like very liquid liquidity management. <laughs> yeah, when the electricity companies could accept lightning payments, then we are living in a great world, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and we will definitely support it as, as hard as we can if uh, this is possible. I'm, I'm, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay, you heard it here first. Uh, he promised in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I also saw in the demo that uh, you have this dashboard uh, now here in, in the website as well, um, right? So what, what exactly is, is shown in there and, and how is that useful? Wow, this is a better question for Pavel. Um, well, the dashboard itself uh, is configurable, so users can move the panels and like put put the information that they find interesting and important to them uh, to the place where they would like to see them. Um, usually, what you see is your uh, total amount of coins that you have mined so far. Uh, you you want to see uh, your confirmed reward, so this is the the reward that could be technically paid out anytime, even before the threshold, if you if you like lower it or something like that. Uh, you should see an estimated reward for the current round, and you should see an unconfirmed reward. Uh, obviously, uh, statistically, statistics for the hash rate for your total account. Uh, anything else I forgot? I think the main reason why we decided to switch to, to this uh, new implementation is to support mobile devices. So it's it's completely responsive. And it allows us to throw away a lot of historical code because it's complete re rewrite, basically. Uh, so the, the biggest opportunities are in front of us. We need to, let's say, make a cleanup in the code. Uh, so this is the first step. And, and the responsive, uh, responsivity is the biggest feature, I think. There are a couple of uh, new features coming uh, already with this release and with future release. I don't remember anything, everything. Yeah. But just it it's it creates a large opportunity for us to change another code. 
Oh, yeah. Okay, very nice. Uh, so we already covered uh, several different topics. Um, are there any things that we've missed so far? Uh, is there anything else that you would like to cover uh, that would be important here for the peers to know at home? We didn't talk about the exchange rate, but that's an area that we don't understand. So <laughs> uh, we can make some, because it's being recorded, we can make some guesses. Uh, and let's see in one year when we meet each other at some conference, you can uh, confront us with our estimates. <laughs> okay. Um, so so um, my theory is that the exchange rate is not going to recover reasonably uh, in less than a year and a half. And when it recovers, we'll probably reach the 10, 20K levels. Until then, it's going to be struggling, going sideways. I mean, now uh, it looks like the start of the bull run, but I don't think it's, it's that yet. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm, it's difficult for me to distinguish between my wish deeply inside and what I would expect, let's say, from a perspective from outside. Um, I think we are not uh, switched to bull run yet. I would really love to see it. Uh, but I'm curious about what's going to happen next year when the halving comes mm -hmm. because the historical experience is pretty consistent let's say um but we'll see i i i'm not sure that we are already uh going up but please tell me i was wrong <laughs> <laughs> well no I, I actually hope that you both are right because i think the bear market is so much more interesting well first and foremost we finally have time to like sit down and get and shit work. done and work yeah right actually uh, and of course to keep yeah. stacking sets uh, so so that's outstanding i really hope that it continues longer <laughs> If or your income is in Bitcoin, uh, it's a different story. But yeah, I, I can definitely understand why people would like to see the, the exchange rate go really down to buy more Bitcoin and uh, good luck with it. Uh, but yeah, it depends on the perspective. Yeah. yeah, it really does. But well, of course, then here, yeah, that, that would be like the age old question Does price follow hash rate or does hash rate follow price? Uh, it's the hash rate following the price. I mean, we can get into details, but I mean, you, we have seen the, the hash rate dropping off after the exchange rate dropping off. And this trend, this downtrend in the hash rate has been there since start of the year, pretty much. Uh, and now it's slowly recovering. Um, so, yeah, I don't think the, the, the notion of uh, price following the hash rate is right. So it's really the hash rate doing the, the thing based on, on the prices. And it's obvious because you have, uh, from, from decentralization perspective, there are like so many mining uh, locations throughout the globe and they have various business conditions which either put them out of business immediately if there's a problem in the exchange rate or they can survive for some time until they run out of funds or they they did the economy math uh, in a solid way and they can survive for even longer. So it depends on the financing and stuff like that. So yeah. and we, can, we could see uh, like really from a close perspective when the price went up, how many investment money were flooding in, into the hardware manufacturing uh, space or at least we know about few companies who were created in in exactly that time when the price were skyrocketing so this is quite obvious that the, the price is I mean, I mean the the hash rate is following not really immediately but but it's a function of price um, yes, I, I would agree, but or, well, I would maybe argue that it's, um, or you, we could better say that entrepreneurs follow demand, right? Uh, and if people demand increased security, which will show in the price of Bitcoin, right, uh, then entrepreneurs will start hashing and providing that service of security, right? Um, but may, maybe then also something that, that I've been thinking a bit is that because a lot of the mining reward is an indirect subsidy uh, in the form of issuance rate, right? New Bitcoin being created. Um, and that kind of dampens the market forces of direct payments. And right? if, if you have a direct payment, you prove praxeologically in that action uh, that you prefer that good which you bought um, at that current price. 
right? Because otherwise you would not have bought it. Right. Um, and a direct payment for security would be a transaction fee for Bitcoin, right? So if you make a on-chain transaction and you pay a fee, like you actively specify that, unless you prove that you actually prefer to have that level of security at that price. Now, because a large portion is an indirect payment, uh, this calculation can no longer be done, right? So, so I would speculate that because we had such a huge portion of uh, the percentage being an indirect payment, that this kind of leads to more boom and bust cycles as we would otherwise see. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I don't have really good insight into this. Um, I just, I can say I agree with you. <laughs> and I'll pass it to Pavel. <laughs> It's an it's interesting perspective. I've never thought about it before. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to command it. Can we talk about this later? <laughs> <laughs> in, in two weeks. In two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah, well, so my background is more economics. And, and that is like, so an increase in the money supply. Um, it, it, Maybe you, you mentioned uh, that community as a whole Values security and it's somehow uh, projected into the price. I'm not sure how the last price movements were driven or strongly in influenced by uh, the community uh, feeling that the Bitcoin is, is secure. Mm -hmm. I would not say so. So there can be some influence in the long term, maybe. Uh, influencers in the space are really loud about these features and this uh, helps to spread the, the information uh, among people but the price movement is more speculation from my perspective I don't think it's based on security uh, like feeling more secure uh, but then probably there is some some connection but I, I cannot quantify it um, yeah, so my counter argument against my own argument okay. <laughs> would. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I really do believe that an indirect payment leads to more mal investments and overconsumption than a direct payment. But because it's very, very transparent. Right? And because everyone knows exactly that there is this indirect subsidy and uh, that it will decrease in the future, I would say that this is, again, a, a tool that entrepreneurs can use for their calculation. Um, and I would say that because it's such a transparent and a predictable market, which is really important of the issuance rate, that that kind of dampens this yeah, maybe perceived volatility. Um, but again, I, I, I hope I'm not right that a huge crash is coming for, for hash rate. <laughs> yeah, so, so you should be really looking forward to halving as well, yeah. because then, the, then your theory could be uh, understood better mm -hmm. if it's right or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah exactly. That, that would be then the proof if, if we have or near zero or really low issuance rate, um, then most of the fee will be a direct payment. Um, and so I'm curious to see if we will still see such exponential growth uh, of the hash rate and then again, some busts. But on the other hand, right, as technology improves, miners get more efficient. And that is also a uh, reason why like, hash rate got up. So mm, that's difficult. And we can expect that uh, the fee is not going to be paid directly by uh, the users. Uh, everything related to... Uh, second level protocols is basically prohibiting it or it's it's a good thing mm -hmm. but the effect of a user deciding what's the right amount of fee is going to be more indirect uh, and one other point I think a lot of users feel like fee is something necessary uh, necessary evil to get transaction through but without understanding the secu security behind mining. Like mining is something which people know it's somehow necessary, but we, we face it every day. Like people don't understand the reasoning why mining is critical and why paying the fees is in long term critical. So this supports my perspective. Uh, the, the price is not really related to this a lot. Uh, I would like if it's stronger relationship there because Bitcoin should be understood and it, in, in this sense is something providing security and how it works. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's about education, I think. 
Yeah, very much so. Um, okay. So again, we covered a lot. Um, any last words? Where can the people find you? Uh, where should they stay uh, up to date? Uh, well, you can find us on uh, Twitter. Uh, Jan Brains is my Twitter handle. Papa will tell his. Uh, if you, if you want to join uh, our open source initiative, just go to brains-os.org. Um, if you want to check out our website for the pool, just go to slash pool and that's pretty much it. Yeah. So if, if you are a miner, I mean, what other mining pool is there other than slash? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for having us here. It was a pleasure. And I will need to refresh my economics studies <laughs> before we meet the next time. <laughs> You, you give me crash courses on the mining stuff. I give you crash courses on the economics. That's, that's a good deal. The division of labor. That's, that's the first economic lesson. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much to both of you for taking time. Uh, and uh, thank you for attending the conference. And of course, for working on this awesome open source software and for contributing. Because uh, again, it's, it's not, um, well, it, it should be the status quo, but it's not. So, so that you are sacrificing your time and your attention and, and your hard-earned uh, well, wealth as well for this is, is quite awesome. Uh, and good to have such great ethical entrepreneurs in the space. And yeah, I'm proud to be a Bitcoin uh, with peers like you on my side. <laughs> oh, peers, see you on the next show. Bye-bye. <laughs>